Hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so you already heard a talk about more or less the same thing from Siemens. So now you will hear a little bit, bit about what the situation is like uh, with Bosch. So like we are a little bit different. Um, maybe what is important to know is that like roughly 60% of the revenue from Bosch is coming from automotive. And, but we have like a lot of other fields as well. And um, from my point of view, at least the most interesting part at the moment, because that's like our subsidiary that I'm working for is actually in, is the Internet of Things. So for Bosch Software Innovations, uh, IoT solutions is something that we are really uh, hardly working on, like working on hard, because that is uh, something that is really important for a company like Bosch, because Bosch is actually working on things like that is what we are producing. We are producing a lot of things and the connection of these things together, making them smarter, that is actually uh, an, an important topic for the entire company. But uh, this is like the focus of Bosch Software Innovations. So already the name of the subsidiary Bosch Software Innovations is telling that it's about software. That is something special and the special thing for uh, all the industrial manufacturers is that actually software is becoming the interesting and the pressuring thing. Software is more or less that thing that uh, is the most of the innovation in, in the things actually that we are producing is becoming more and more um, it's more and more done in, in the software part and no longer that much in the software part. So, like also other companies are seeing that, so it's not alone that they're seeing that uh, software is becoming more and more important. It's also, for example, General Electric said every industrial company will become a software company. So, you've seen that with the Siemens talk. I'm telling you that. that like the really important thing for us in the future. Interesting is that. Mike Milovic uh, from the Eclipse Foundation said that at the Eclipse Con that all the, all the software companies are more or less becoming or are open source companies. Sorry for using the term open source and not free software. I know there are like more like uh, different, yeah, yeah, like that. People are seeing different meanings for that, like in a company, in the big companies, like more or less for them, it's free software, libre software, open source, they are all are more or less saying, for us it's the same, we don't understand the difference, but I know there are differences, so sorry for that. Um, yeah, so you, you can see more or less that every, all the big uh, software companies, but also the manufacturing companies, they are all getting somehow involved in open source development, but uh, f like first of all, that is what more or less all are doing, they're using open source software. So what can you actually do to use, how can you actually use that for reaching strategic goals? And that is actually what typically inside a company the people are interested in. How can I actually make use of that for reaching my business goals? And I've just listed a, a few things what you can do. Like the factor standardization is like a really obvious thing. Whenever you uh, have a successful software, it's becoming something like a standard. Everyone is more or less using it. And so it doesn't matter if there is like a standard written, like a specification or something. If when 90% of the people are using it, it is a de facto standard. So whenever you use something that is that widely uh, in use, or whenever you actually develop something like that by yourself, you have something that is a standard. Collaboration is really important because, uh, you know, when you're trying to write down everything in contracts, for example, a joint venture between companies, you often have the situation that actually at the end you will spend two years or something like that to negotiate how the company will look like in the future to develop something together and then afterwards share the revenue or the, the profit from that. And when actually the real focus is that you want to have a technology in place and not making a lot of profit or something like uh, from it, for example, with commodity, it's much easier to just say, hey, come on, let's just develop this together. 
for example, in some kind of foundation, the Linux foundation, the Eclipse foundation, or anything like that, by these rules, and let's start tomorrow instead of in two years. Minimizing dependencies on suppliers, that's another thing that is really important. So like every all, all of these big companies, they're um, producing big things that uh, cost a lot of money, and uh, for them it's really bad, as you just heard, like there was this uh, problem with the supp supplier, I think from Volkswagen or something, and uh, so they were fighting about how uh, at one point they're going to deliver that again. It's always a little bit difficult if you're really uh, like depend on your supplier. So in a way, it's it's nice to to be more independent so that you can use the software uh, without having uh, certain limitations. For example, uh, like being able to further develop and things like that. So that's another really important thing, strategic goal that companies like to achieve. Viral marketing. More or less, it's everyone needs to needs uh, every company wants that their products are known that everyone knows what they're doing. But it's not only the product themselves; it's also the underlying technology. So we are trying to build up ecosystems. These ecosystems are living from that. Actually, people, a lot of people use it, know it, are in part of that, and that is more or less making all that known. It's more or less transporting your products by themselves. It's a really useful thing for. Uh, for the company. Often with that, what I just said, it's not only that you're establishing something that has already been there, you're actually establishing the entire market. So establishing this new market is another way uh, or is another thing that can be an interesting effect. If like uh, you're using some kind of technology or need some kind of technology in there uh, or y you ha maybe have something that is more or less um, useful for you and others, but there is something like a monopoly around it, like it then it's, it's interesting to see, okay, is there something we can do about it? And that is like another way how um, open source can be used. Increasing the quality is, is, is another thing. Uh, just having a lot of people that are doing the peer review, I think all of you know that, is just like, as you have it in science, it's just like a nice way to have increasing quality. Speed is something else, of course, when, when you're not st starting from the scratch, but just take everything that is already there, you're just faster. I think it's really simple. Um, the, the risk is another thing. If something goes wrong, you're at least in a good company. So like having, like sharing more or less in a special domain, you're seeing, okay, we need to have this stuff that is underneath our actual product. But uh, yeah, it needs to be, for example, really reliable. Then it's often, it's in the, we are in the situation we can buy that from someone. But the other way is that we are actually doing that together. And that is also then, of course, the effect is that we are reducing the cost. But reducing the cost and like, especially the last three things, I, uh, when I gave that talk and was talking about that, people were saying, why, what, what are you talking about? Like, it's much cheaper if we just buy that stuff. Yes, it might be cheaper to buy this stuff in a certain situation than but what I'm talking about here is when we are in the situation that we actually have to develop that by ourselves. So it's comparing development for us to developing something with someone else together. And in this situation, the quality and the speed and the risk and the costs, we have some really positive effects if we are doing that together with someone else. In certain settings, in other settings, it's not useful for us. But that, is not, that has nothing to do only with bar software innovations or something like that. This is like a general thing, like every company can have a look. Okay, is that something we want to use like one of these things to reach these strategic goals. Like an interesting thing in general is when you look at the price of software, how it has developed, I, I don't really know the, the metrics behind that. And by the way, just to give like their credits, I've taken a lot of the slides or several of these slides from the talk from Mike Milenkovic, and he has like this really nice uh, nice thing below it because he, they pub he published his own slides under the EPL. So it's nice that I can use that because it's really nice compilation. And uh, so we can even do with the slides, we can do some open sourcing. So um, 
Yeah, so the price of the software itself it dropped tremendously from, from the 80s down to today. So today it's like 0.7% of the price that it was at that point in time. I'm not really sure about what the matrix is behind it, and I think it's, it doesn't really matter. The point is just to understand that the prices have dropped tremendously. My guess is at least that it is like the price that you pay per line of software. If it is maybe for the entire product, even uh, even like better, because that would mean actually, for example, that uh, for example, a word processor today and a word processor at that time, that time it was much much more simple and really small. So the com amount of code would have been like a, a fraction of that. So, but anyway, this is for sure that the price dropped tremendously. It's not like that with the salaries of the developers. So more or less. You have to pay exactly the same price for developers or maybe even much more, but you cannot sell that software in this way. Okay, the market has grown and whatever, but the point is just what, what uh, the guy from Siemens said, it's really, really hard to develop software in a way, if you're trying to do everything from the scratch, that it is really uh, business-like and profitable. So the, it is the typical thing what, what's happening that a lot of people are using commodity software and like the biggest pool of commodity software that you have right now is just this, all this open source software that is around. Another thing that is interesting in this, uh, in this area is that actually the software itself is more and more not the business model that is used, not selling the software, but selling everything that is like on top of that, typically everything is a service. With, you're seeing the same thing with smartphone apps, you're seeing this with websites, which are more or less providing functionality on the server, and you're also seeing that with cloud. So actually that people are buying software and need, like doing the integration by themselves and doing all of that around, it's typically no, no, not that business model that is uh, like growing the most. Typically these service-driven uh, uh, business models are the ones that are going forward. The other thing is that actually we, uh, there are a lot of transformations in the business area from value chains to business ecosystems. More or less, it's that you have a really complex situation where you have like a lot of different stakeholders and different systems that are somehow working together. And at the end, you will have something like a, um, a service to the customer, but it's no longer that you have one little piece and that you can sell that easily without all these things around it. In this complex situation, it's no longer the focus that much on these little components, but it's about that something is working as expected. So open source in this area has been proven to be able to establish some kind of some of these ecosystems because it's more or less then you have one component that is out there as technology, but it is already pre-integrated in the surrounding technologies and in, in the services and, every, and everything like that. And it is used by a, wide, uh, by, the, by a wide range of users, and it is like that, already part of an ecosystem. So when you're like publishing your software, you're actually building up an ecosystem around it and like making sure that it's properly integrated in its surrounding and no, not only just write some code and just throw it out on the market. The problem with the ecosystems is that typically, um, like platform business, for example, uh, typically only the big ones survive and the small ones die. But that is an interesting thing because actually what, what small fishes can do and uh, a lot of the, even the industrial manufacturers are compared to the IT giants small in the IT business. So like it is a, like a different kind of way like w what is happening there. Like you have sometimes a situation where you actually want to establish some kind of technology in software and you're not in the situation to do that on your own. So it's really great that you're teaming up with someone else. And that is more or less what these swarms are doing. They're just gathering together so they can survive the big fish. In this situation, the, it's, uh, the developer has a very spe special role. Like, like there's, there's this book out there, uh, which is really interesting, which is more or less saying the new kingmakers are the developers. That is in a way true in, in two directions. So for the ecosystems, it's really important that a lot of people are interested, participating, using it, developing it, giving feedback and all that on a high level of skill. 
So that is for the ecosystems, but it's also true for the companies. The companies need people that are highly skilled in the certain area where they need the expertise. So like, uh, that is actually what this, took, what, what this book is talking about. The book is saying more or less when you're like the, you need to hire the right talent to actually be a successful in the technology area. And so this way, like wherever the developers are going to, this company has a good chance to become like the new king. When you're looking at the, at like the forecasts again from Eclipse, at the forecasts where for the IoT world, um, they're like in 2020, there is the forecast that you need 4.5, 4 or there will be 4.5 million of developers, uh, in the IoT area. So the question, where should all these developers come from? One thing. And the other thing is how are like, who is actually like, the most successful in hiring the right talent for that. And so more or less, that is uh, the question, uh, that is the thing that is uh, where like companies need to be successful, they need to be successful in building up the ecosystems, they need to be successful in acquiring the right uh, talent, getting the people on board for the ecosystem, for the products, for the company. And if they cannot do that, like for, for, for only for their own, like for example, for proprietary technology, then they also have to stick to the communities, to the ecosystems. So it's a really natural choice to, when you're looking at the market and then thinking about, okay, is it like uh, really likely that we are able to set here, like gather the, the critical mass for a community, or is it maybe that we need to do that with someone else? Often the question comes up, so okay, fine. There are like a bunch of people gathering together and they're trying to build something, but how can we actually make sure that this, what is coming out of that is something good and is something solid and something that is usable? And then I always refer to this uh, analogy to the, like the termite hills, because the termite hills is actually, are, they are actually built in a self-organizing way without any individual termite knowing actually what is going on there. So they just, it's far beyond their brain capacity to actually build something like that. But they have a simple pattern to know exactly, okay, when I'm there, when I'm seeing this situation, I have to do this. And that's actually how this builds up. It's more or less, in a way, also something like that um, with a software development. You don't need to know the big picture in its full extent. You just need to know something about this little thing that is now just your focus. And when you're able to improve this little thing that is in your focus, which of course is with software developers far, far more than with termites, but still, you know, like looking at the entire software uh, that is out there currently in the world, this is really complex and no one can really understand that in detail in the full extent. So, but you can focus on something really little and you can make this local improvement and then you will have still like a, in general, you can have a uh, global improvement. And that is more or less what is happening here. So what does that mean for IoT? As I said, IoT, that is like the focus that uh, we have at Bosch Software Innovations. There it is actually the situation that there, today we have these silos of solutions. We have types of devices, typically they're very specific devices from one vendor, and you have IoT solutions on top of that. That's nothing new. That has been there for a while. And so you, what you have, like for the industrial manufacturers, actually what they like is they want to have future products. They want to have these IoT solutions. So what they're currently selling is these devices. But they, what they are interested in, hey, it would be cool if we can actually get into this business where, where we are like uh, offering additional service on top of that. That's what they love. So, but what you require is actually some kind of middleware that is connecting these things together. So for every silo, more or less, at the moment, it's like that you're actually developing, developing that with generic software just for this specific solution. The vision for the future, that is not, that is not something uh, new. I think everyone is, it's a logical step, is that you actually have something in between that is like a platform. So, you, so that you're, that the, that the implementation of an IoT solution is just much more simple and you can just have like very fast IoT solutions 
And the other thing that would be really great is that actually you can have IoT solutions that can handle a lot of different devices, cross-vendor, cross-domain. So you can have something that is in a car, and you can have that with you, something that is at home or at work or like with weather stations or whatever, connecting all across these different things. And that is something like typically that is considered now the IoT cloud. So you have IoT servers on top, like really as thin as possible. You have IoT enabled uh, devices below there. And you have as a middleware, like an IoT, a generic IoT platform. So at the moment, everyone loves to have that thing. They want to have this I I generic IoT platform. Everyone from all the like, technology areas all around these things coming in there and say, yeah, that would be great. I would like to have my IoT uh, platform, the one that is like having all these devices connected to them, and I want to be the one that is like leading this entire thing, and everyone should come just to my IoT platform. The problem is, of course, not everyone can to come to every platform, because otherwise we would just have thousands and thousands of platforms and thousands of, uh, of devices that, that would just be connected to all of these things. So at the end, there will be like a large battle, and the question is which platform at the end will win. And there are like two different possible outcomes. Is one is like there is like a closed IoT platform monop monopolized, and like uh, one company or two. I, the guess is there will be at least like two, three, or four, or five maybe, but not 100 or something like that. So, and if it's closed, the guess is of course that this maximum that this provider will maximize, like every company uh, does, they will just maximize their profit for this platform. And this will be not good for the ones that are having business up here and the having business down here, because that will minimize their profit. And they will have little control and influence over that. So the idea is actually that, the idea is actually that, we, uh, that someone might just stand up and say, hey, it would be really cool to have an open IoT platform. And with this open, with this open IoT platform, you have more influence, you have maximized profit up here, you have maximized profit up here. But this people in there that develop that, they might not have that much profit. So then it means for these ones up there and these ones down there, actually, it's just something we want to have, but it's something that we need to get established somehow. And that's just a really good case for open source. Let's just develop this thing together and make sure that this platform exists so we can have profit up here, profit up here. There will be a lot of... Um, competition, so it's good for the customers, but because with this, uh, because with this competition, the prices are going down, the quality is, will improve, and so on and so on. So that's exactly like uh, something that I've heard from a lot of different uh, companies in this area, that they are more or less saying, that seems to be something, uh, that seems to be a good idea. It's not only like, um, like a lot of different companies are saying that. I've just put here like one, uh, one, one example, like that was uh, Intel saying more or less open source will be something that will be important in the IoT world. And here we have chosen to uh, work together with the, with the Eclipse IoT working group um, to establish something like that, a platform that will help that and getting components uh, from, our, from our stack from here. So you see, for example, also Siemens in here. But it's also like Bosch is here. I don't know where it is. Well, here. But there are also uh, a lot of different companies. So we've introduced three open source projects there Eclipse Hono, Hawkbit, and Vorto. We just don't have mu so much time to go into the details, but everyone who is interested can just look it up. And we also are like, participating in three other ones that are uh, in, in the IoT working group. Lishan, Californium, and Vakama. And there's just something new coming up from Eurotech. We, they have open sourced their entire IT backend. So there are a lot of interesting things going on, and we are like, really hoping that this will be successful, that there's like, an open IoT platform out there. Like a little bit from Cloud Foundry, which is a nice thing below that. Appsticle, that is something like doing that to the car. And we heard about Software 360. And because the Siemens uh, people have to, like, uh, talked about it already, we are also, as he said, like, uh, in there and working there together. So I, I think it's not like, worth uh, like, explaining that now, because we maybe have a little bit more time for one or two questions. So I'm just clicking through. Thank you for the... 
for your attention. So, anyone has any questions for Stefan? Please raise your hand and rush over with Mike. I've made you speechless. Okay. So, fine. Then yeah. thank you for your attention and have a good day.